stay in these workshops and think through these topics. Um, and really excited to have him kick off this morning. Uh, thanks very much, Beth. Um, and it's great to be here. It's, uh, for those of you who haven't met already, I work with uh, as a consultant uh, in a group a team called the Capital Science and Policy Practice at Willis Towers Watson, which is a global risk advisory uh, company. And um, but my background is I'm a volcanologist, so um, I, I my my knowledge of uh, the science of floods is not very good. But um, if you want to know about erupting volcanoes, then I'm the guy to come and see. Um, and uh, but most recently, last 15 years or so, I've been working in the uh, in the developing parametric insurance solutions for developing countries on the whole. And uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit today about that um, and, uh, and the relevance of uh, Earth observation data. I'm not going to talk a lot about flooding, to be honest. Um, I do have a couple of slides which are specific on flooding, but I'm going to give you a feel for um, why I think the time is ripe right now for uh, for moving moving things forward for uh, there is a lot of potential end users out there um, to, to David's point from early yesterday um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to try and give you a flavor of of who those are and why why those end users are there um, and also some examples of where we've uh, put parametric insurance solutions in place and uh, and then just uh, kind of end with a few uh, a few Kind of key key points which I think are, will be good to take into the rest of the day. So what's the global setting for natural disaster risk management and risk financing? Um, there's certainly a, a, a hugely increased political profile of natural disaster risk. I, I think you're all very well aware of that. Um, climate risk in particular um, uh, and, and the, the, there's a you know, a, a need therefore for uh, for practical tools to manage the consequences um, through building resilience and uh, and insurance is is part of that because the insurance industry does this as its day to day job. Um, it's not the whole solution, but uh, insurance as a as a discipline and as an institutional um, form is uh, that deals with risk, uh, analyzes it, uh, and uh, and can put a price on it, which is extremely important. Um, it's not necessarily the answer to all your money questions, by the way, but um, but it, it does bring bring risk into the real uh, economic and financial sphere, uh, which is is critical. Um, example is the um, the global risk outlook from the World Economic Forum. Um, this is the uh, I'll show you on the next slide the the 2018 version where environmental risks uh, the three furthest into the top right corner, which are the both the most impactful and the most um, uh, likely, so the, big, the biggest kind of global risks are all environmental risks. Um, the, uh, so, so definitely high on the, on the OECD kind of agenda. Um, last week in Bariloche, there was the first ever insurance forum for the G20. Um, Argentina are the chair of the G20 this year. Um, and uh, um, so, you know, and various other, um, other places where it's coming to the uh, Higher, higher and higher up the agenda. And this is both in emerging, uh, both in, in developed economies, but also in emerging and developing economies. Um, and, and in the latter, the sustainable development goals, um, as, uh, as David said yesterday, Sendai framework, uh, the Paris Agreement, um, for the first time in the UNF's C process, actually kind of, uh, I felt the, the big thing uh, in Paris was the identification that actually, uh, we're talking about risk management uh, in the climate space, and uh, what you know. What are the tools? Um, insurance is obviously mentioned specifically, but there's much more to it than that. And then there's this thing called Insure Resilience, which is a G7 initiative under the German presidency um, chairmanship in um, 2014, uh, 15, and um, uh, that's. I'll say a little bit more about that as well. Um, this is uh, just the the uh, the world. Economic Forum's Global Risk Outlook, and you see top top right is um, is the the really big big global events. Or the green ones are environmental ones. So you can see the to the top right corner is the uh, or the top right quadrant quadrant is the uh, the area of real interest from a global perspective. And you can see all five of the uh, all five of the environmental risks that they uh, that they they capture are in that in that quadrant. 
Um, you'll all be very, very well aware of the Thai floods in 2011. That was another wake-up call, I think, for uh, from more from a commercial perspective of the uh, interruption to uh, global supply chains. So all of this is kind of feeding into the uh, the, the, the narrative that uh, climate risk in particular is becoming more and more real, uh, both on the political side and on the commercial side. Um, we've also developed over the past uh, 30 years or so um, a, a, a massively increased ability to assess and understand risk. Um, you know, we talked about this, others talked about it a lot yesterday. Um, uh, and uh, from, from the insurance perspective, that's, that's uh, captured in the catastrophe, catastrophe risk modeling world. Uh, which started in the late 80s, coming out of sci out of academic science, and uh, it's been now absolutely completely mainstreamed into the global, certainly the the reinsurance market. So the global, the ultimate risk takers of of catastrophe risk, um, it, it's completely mainstreamed. Uh, it's it, some catastrophe modeling is done for every single deal um, of of consequence uh, on a global scale, and even uh, at the insurance level, um, certainly for the big the big markets, it's a it's a normal day-to-day -day tool that's in, in use. Um, what that's, this has done has led to much greater stability and efficient capital deployment in the international um, global, sorry, the global uh, economic system uh, can, can manage big risk events much, much more effectively and efficiently than it was before. Um, and it's also, you know, it's opened up a new investment class. So uh, in, insurance linked securities are, uh, have been growing year on year since 2008. Uh, they started before that. The, the collapse of Lehman Brothers actually put an interruption to it because Lehman were, were involved in almost all of the cap bond deals that were in place in 2008, um, uh, guarant guaranteeing the return actually not, not to do with the risk side, uh, the, the primary risk side. But, um, but ever since then, it's been growing um, and uh, it's still a pretty small, small asset class from a, a global perspective, but, but definitely growing. And that, that's an indication that, that risk as a commodity is kind of more, uh, much more accessible, if you like. Um, and uh, uh, so um, the, uh, the de deployment of CAP models, I think, is going to expand, um, and it could do that fairly quickly. Uh, the, the TCFD, the Task Force on Climate-Related climate Financial Disclosures, which is a uh, financial stability board, which is a G20 uh, um, body, which was set up after the global financial crisis um, in 2010, I think. Um, the TCFD is, is uh, very active, uh, it's chaired by Mark Carney, and, um, and, and that, their, their outputs are starting to, uh, to feed into regulation of, um, of the uh, asset management and banking sectors, for example. So starting to put tools in place that the insurance industry has been using for 20 years or so um, into uh, a much broader range of economic uh, activities. Um, and we see this particularly quickly in happening in Europe, but it's also happening in the U.S. as well. And, um, and I think will will uh, grow in in its in import over the over the coming years. Um, another interesting thing, I, I um, this is this is a relatively recent um, development, or certainly recent to me, is uh, that I've come across it. Um, the, the the force majeure concept in contract law is starting to be coming under a lot of questions, particularly related to climate risk. And um, this is all part of the, the overall, well, wait a minute, we can quantify this to some extent. So, so we need to, we can't just use a, say an act of God has, has got in the way. So, and I think again, that, that along with the TCFD and other things is gonna um, really have an impact. So I think the, uh, the understanding of risk and the quantifying of risk, um, uh, and particularly climate risk is is going to have a, a lot more end users um, in the in the coming years, and a lot of those are you know big financial actors. Um, this is just to illustrate the, uh, the 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 role that cap models have played in uh, insurance in in global risk pricing. Let's say, and this is an index uh, which uh, Guy Carpenter do every year. It's a um, basically a rate online, so a, a price index for global cap risk, if you like. You can see both the volatility and the um, and most recently the pricing has been um, has been falling and this is uh, independent effectively of insured losses. Um, so it, it's not because we're having less insured losses. We all know that we're not, and certainly um, uninsured losses are, are growing even more quickly. But so this is this is a result of us understanding and deploying capital more effectively. 
Um, so what about in the development context? Well, um, I think we've, uh, disaster risk in, in a pure development context has been, um, you know, talked about quite a lot, um, 29 billion a year in the 77 poorest countries in the world. Um, I think this was 2016 numbers, I, I believe, um, and uh, of which international aid, so humanitarian support generally is about 8%, uh, insurance about 3%. So um, from an insurance perspective, but also the, uh, the, the, the tools and services that go around insurance um, have a very, a very low penetration rate. Um, uh, and the, the thing that I've, uh, I've always tried to uh, convey when I'm talking to ministers of finance uh, in, in developing world governments is that um, just because we've identified a risk um, doesn't mean that we've created it. It's there already. It's having some impact on your ongoing economy. It's uh, um, somebody is paying for that risk. Um, and so um, when, uh, when they compare, you know, the price of an insurance policy uh, to, you know, what they're paying now, which, which they see as zero, uh, it's always going to look expensive. But actually, if you look at the, uh, the underlying impacts on development, um, on, on individuals, et cetera, then um, it, it, it can be incredibly cost effective uh, to, 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 uh, to manage it more effectively. Um, uh, the, the obvious, um, you know, things that, that we see in the, in the developed world as well are even more um, to the fore in the developing world. Uh, financial um, selling of assets um, in Africa. I'll talk a little bit about African risk capacity uh, later. Um, but um, one of the big driving forces for ARC is not, is not because insurance uh, in and of itself is a, is a, is a great thing, but, um, but if, you can, if you can get in after a drought uh, before people start selling their assets, then their economic, uh, their fall down the economic ladder is massively reduced. Um, so there's a four to, four to five times benefit, um, we think, and maybe in some situations even higher than that, of acting quickly and more quickly than the standard humanitarian response. So, um, but we all see, I, I've spent quite a lot of time in Haiti over the years and, um, and the, uh, the level of exposure to natural disasters there is, is huge. We all know that, but, um, but there's, there's that until recently, there hadn't been very much of a link made between that and the, you know, the very slow economic development that's going on in Haiti. But to me, they're uh, intimately linked. Um, so, uh, but then there's also, I think, over the last few years, and probably le less than five years, um, th this kind of thinking has come actually into the humanitarian space uh, in, a, in, a, um, in, in a very compelling way in terms of, uh, of, of both understanding the causes of humanitarian disasters, but also responding more quickly to them. And um, for those of you who are not aware and, and are interested in this space, I very much recommend a very accessible book called Dull Disasters by um, Daniel Clark, who was at the World Bank for a long time, um, uh, now works in the British government, and Stefan Durkon, who was the uh, chief economist at DFID for in the UK for many years, a professor at Oxford. Um, very, 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 very accessible, very readable, and basically, it's saying um, we need better planning for post-disaster action. We need um, evidence-based decision making, uh, and we need uh, financing, but also uh, a, a, a um, the, the appropriate uh, um, uh, responsibilities are assigned between the different stakeholders. So um, it shouldn't be governments de facto um, are, are liable for everything or donors in the humanitarian space, but, but we have to sit down and think uh, rationally before these events happen how, that, how the response and who's responsible for which elements of the response. This is very much what uh, what we're, we're we're trying to do with Arc um, is start starting to build the the kind of infrastructure, if you like, that will um, will enable this kind of approach. Um, it's not going to work all the time, and it's certainly not 100% of the answer. But um, but but um, when you have somebody like Stefan, who's who's worked his entire very illustrious career, academic career, and and applied applied side as well, um, I, I think it's worth listening to. Um, and then there's the, uh, the the bigger global development policy context, and uh, David spoke a little bit about this. Um, 
this slide is is probably a year and a half old now um so it was i um i, I didn't update it but i mean these four 2015 and early 2016 um international um agreements and uh, and events really have shaped uh probably the next 20 25 years of um of uh, potentially of of action uh, maybe 25 years is too long but um certainly in the next 15 years um sendai Addis Ababa action agenda, uh, which uh, and then that feeds into the finance. That's the financing part of the sustainable development goals, um, the Paris Agreement, and the World Humanitarian Summit, particularly uh, uh, on the humanitarian side. I'm going to skip that. I think you're probably all aware of the sustainable development goals, um, but almost all of them have some risk element to them. Um, and uh, uh, so, and this is just a, uh, a highlight. Um, you don't need to. To take in the slide, but um, there's something called the Ensure Resilience Global Partnership, which is a German government-led um, initiative which came out of the G7 um, Ensure Resilience Initiative. Um, and then there's something called the London Centre for Global Disaster Protection, which is a, a, a DFID-funded um, program. Both of these have, have basically sprung up in the last year, and uh, both of them are, are, are uh, have significant funding um, and uh, are going to be supporting. Uh, development uh, world efforts in this in this particular space. Um, so, uh, those of you who are not not aware of those two initiatives, I, I very much um, point you to, uh, to to get to know them a little bit, and um, I'm happy to provide introductions as well um, to the to the people who are running those two programs. Um, the other thing I, I wanted to, before we kind of move on to the next um, next section, I, I just wanted to uh, kind of highlight that um, there is much more engagement in the developing and emerging sovereign and sub-sovereign space uh, on these issues, and particularly on the financial aspects of them or the quantitative aspects of them, than um, uh, has been growing significantly over the ten, last 10 to 15 years. Um, I think uh, disaster risk management when I first got into this space uh, 20, 25 years ago was, um, was all about kind of response and response actions. Um, it started to, to go into hazard assessment, um, but is now, I think there's a much better understanding of the full risk assessment, uh, the full economic consequences, et cetera. Um, I personally have talked to probably 35 ministers of finance um, or, or ministers of finance for 35 countries, I would say. Um, over the last 12 years, um, 13 years maybe, uh, so um, and all, all in developing world countries, um, and uh, so there is there is a hook into almost every um, every developing world country, uh, it, which which can be expanded fairly quickly to be be um, talking about what we're what we're here to talk about. Um, uh, that includes both not not only insurance as a as a kind of a tool, but also natural assessment of disaster risk, um, ownership of risk, um, and then uh, different risk management tools, and the sharing of that risk between individuals, communities, uh, local, regional government, etc. Um, you know that the, at least the concepts of those are starting to be understood. Actually, implementing um, kind of joined up risk management plans across a whole country, and and including all of those different uh, elements is is uh, far from being mainstreamed but um but i think the the understanding at least those conversations are starting um, i'm going to slip over skip over these that that last one but um just a couple of practical examples um arc i've talked about a little bit already um is covering a big a big chunk of the uh of the kind of theory of identifying risks planning financing decision processes and then delivery and beneficiaries um, that, that kind of this is more in the humanitarian space uh, and also the Red, Red Cross Red Crescent um, has been doing some really interesting stuff on forecast based financing and and similarly you know tr triggering even uh, pre pre disaster action um, and uh, uh, if if you had gone into um, anybody in the Lloyd's market or anywhere else in the insurance space five years ago and said, we're going to, we, we want to do a, an insurance policy which triggers before an event's happened, you would have been laughed out of town. Um, but we, we are having those conversations now. Um, so 
What, the reason why we're having those current conversations is because of something called parametric insurance. And I'm, I'm going to kind of, I'll, I'll skip through this fairly quickly. Obviously, the slides will be available, I presume, if they're not. Uh, then, um, so you can kind of delve back in, and I'm very happy to answer questions. Um, but I did want to, to spend a little bit of time on it because um, I was at a volcano conference a couple of weeks ago and um, talking about parametric insurance. And my old volca volcano colleagues, you know, very technical people, all of them, um, didn't have a clue what I was talking about. So, um, so I've, I've, I've assumed that you guys, most of you guys, don't have much of an idea what parametric insurance is. Um, but I think it's important to, uh, to, to understand. So um, traditional insurance, you know, you wait until a, um, a, a disaster happens and then you go in and, uh, and work out what the losses are. You argue about what the losses are actually generally. If you're a, you're a homeowner and you have a loss adjuster come, you're, you're not going to come to the same conclusion about what your losses were as the loss adjuster. Um, so um, it's not, it's not, quite cut and dried, but uh, that's generally the way that uh, indemnity insurance has, has developed. And it's been around for more than 300 years. And it's, uh, it's served, certainly served the, uh, the first industrial revolution extremely well. Um, I haven't put the plot here, but if you look at the plot of uh, UK GDP uh, growth in the late, seven, late 18th, early 19th century against insurance penetration, they're tracking exactly. Um, a, a mill owner would not invest in a mill um, if they didn't have fire insurance. Um, so, um, but in the, in the modern, um, you know, the third and fourth industrial revolutions, we don't see that, uh, it's not, it's not happening. Um, but we, what we have seen is a, a start, the development of this, um, this new form of insurance. It started in the, um, weather risk markets in the, in the U S, uh, for energy companies mainly, um, who wanted to, uh, to be able to hedge out their additional costs for uh, either cooling, cooling in very hot a number of hot days, or um, or uh, heating in a number of cold days, uh, more than a you know, normal number of cold days in a row, for example. So that th there's there's a pretty active uh, weather derivatives market in the U.S. and increasingly in the in the e in the European Union as well, a little bit in Japan, uh, where there are about 20 standardized indices. These run off uh, off ground stations on the whole in big cities, and um, and they can be bought. They're traded, um, you know, on a daily basis. So it's uh, it's um, mainly through the Chicago uh, Mercantile Exchange. Um, but that um, so weather risk is, ha, has been traded for for uh, probably twenty years, um, and and is pretty much main, mainstream, but in a in a fairly small uh, niche market. Um, what we what we started to do in the um, about thirteen years ago was was look to see how those these same principles could be applied to um, to, to bigger catastrophe events uh, hurricanes and earthquakes were the two that we kind of started with um, and um, and i I worked with the world bank in, uh, in two thousand started working with them in two thousand four and five to uh, to set up the Caribbean Catastrophe Risk Insurance Facility, which used parametric insurance to, to insure against, for the governments to insure against um, hurricanes and earthquakes. Um, so payments for a parametric uh, insurance policy are, are made on an agreed scale based on the movement of an index. The index is selected so that it's a good proxy for, for loss, damage, or impact. Basically, uh, it can be, you know, if in its kind of most uh, in its form, most similar to uh, regular insurance, it would be a proxy for loss, um, as, as you would would adjust that loss. Um, but it can be a very, very much kind of looser uh, impacts, um, which makes it a really interesting tool for in the development space. Um, so, I, as a very simple example, there, um, you know, less than a certain amount of rain falls over a certain amount of time, then the contract triggers, um, and uh, what you need is is that real time monitoring of that that uh, index, and uh, as I'll come on to say later, um, Earth observation is a very very obvious uh, source for that information, uh, particularly in the developing world. Um, and if the trigger is threshold is met, then the payout's released. Uh, there's no there's no second guessing it. There's no going in afterwards and seeing if the if the if the trigger actually. Um, did what it or, or the event did what we thought it would do on the ground. Um, 
the 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 contract is based on the on the index itself, uh, and that means that the payout can go out very quickly. Um, and so that's the other huge benefit of uh, parametric insurance is that uh, in the Caribbean, for example, the governments have received their their payouts and 130 million plus of payouts so far in the in the 10 years, 11 years that it's been operating. Um, all of them have, have flowed within 14 days. Um, nobody gets an insurance claim settled um, within three months, generally, uh, after a big natural catastrophe. Uh, in the Caribbean, um, Sean knows this very well, um, there's a big hurricane in the Caribbean. The, 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 the regular loss adjustment uh, community is about 10, 10 people across the English-speaking Caribbean. Um, 10 people after a nat cat in any of the islands, let alone one that's hit multiple islands, is a is the work of a hundred plus. So it's just you can't you just cannot adjust claims uh, very quickly, um, and that goes goes for everywhere in the world actually. Um, if you look at Chile after the earthquake in 2012, was it? Um, you know there were there were more than half of the claims were outstanding um, a year later. Uh, I think Maria. I'm not sure of the actual numbers, but I I know that the Maria the Maria actual loss estimates are moving all the time because the adjustment process is still ongoing. Um, and this is, we're more than a year past Maria now. Um, so, um, and then just to add that the indices are, are, are almost always measured by, or, or at least verified by a, by a third party. Um, I say almost always because I have a, a, have a case right at the end where we, we, ha we have managed to put together deals where, um, where the measurement is, um, is not, is not totally external to either to the to the client, but um, but that's the norm is that uh, to take out the moral hazard of pouring water into a rain gauge or something, um, you, uh, you 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 want to have it uh, the measurement made by a third party, uh, and and public domain sources are obviously uh, perfect. Really, I mean they're they're ideal because they they provide fantastic transparency. So. Um, it's very difficult for either the markets, the, the risk takers, or the clients to, to argue when, when you say, well, I'm just going to go to this website and take that data from the USGS, from NASA, from NOAA, whoever it is. Um, so I've, I've run through some of these already. Um, uh, the, the parametric is very good for disaster response financing because of the speed. Um, and, uh, and as I said earlier, Money, money quickly is, is much, much more valuable in, in all disaster response, um, but particularly where you, you avoid sales of assets like a slow onset events like droughts, um, but also in, in hurricanes as well. I, there's very good evidence that, uh, that, that um, injection of liquidity and, and ability to, uh, to, to for, the, for the, both the government to spend money and also the communities to spend money um, maintains the markets and um, and aids recovery hugely. Um, the the, uh, the the contract settlement is very clean as well. It takes a lot of the political angle out of uh, out of insurance. Um, and um, off the record, I'm um, I have many stories of where um, where kind of insurance is used as a political tool. Um, and with parametric, you can you can eliminate that effectively. Um, and so, you know, the Minister of Finance has to sign on the dotted line for a, for a contract, and then it's a contract, and, um, and it's on an index which is verified or, or measured by a third party, um, and there's, there's not much wiggle room there. Um, and as I said, there, there are some now being, uh, we're, we're now thinking about doing uh, forecast-based uh, financing and, and, you know, triggering on, on either a forecast or, or certainly you know the obvious case is upstream upstream flooding, which is going to inevitably move downstream and, and getting a, a week a week advance in the, in the big river basins, for example, in the Niger river basin. Um, you know those floods take two weeks to move down the basin. So um, so that that you know really is is there's great potential there, and, and for no regrets uh, investments really. Um, uh, the other thing about parametric insurance I just want to mention, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you some examples of this, is that it's, it's, it's very bespoke. So um, it's, it's really pretty flexible. Um, with, if you're buying insurance for your house, you basically buy insurance for your house, and it's the value of your house. Uh, governments insuring themselves, uh, you, what, what value do they want to insure from, from 
yes, they can insure all of their assets, but most of the governments I've worked with don't have any clue about where their assets are, let alone what they're worth. Um, so, um, whereas with, with parametric insurance, um, you, can, you can model out what the impacts are gonna be across a broad range of government activities, including property loss, but also you know, loss of tax revenue. All of those sorts of things can be, can be looked into, and then you can find a proxy for those in an, in an index, and they can buy the index. And they don't have to buy 100% of the index, they can buy a relatively small fraction of that index, um, but it will respond in the way that they need it to. So if there's a bigger disaster where they'll need more money, they'll get more of a payout, but it may not be in anywhere near what, all the money that they need. But um, So uh, it, it, parametric insurance is unique in that way that, that we can effectively um, we can effectively tune it to exactly the requirements of the client. Um, I'm gonna skip over these slides a little bit, um, just in the interest of time, um, uh, but, but those are the two end members. You know, a, a simple parametric, which I described right at the front, uh, what we would call a, um, a binary. So it meets a trigger threshold of an index and it pays. Um, and uh, indemnity is, is obviously um, the loss adjustment side. But there are actually a couple of uh, additional um, forms of parametric insurance in the, in the middle, um, getting increasing in complexity, um, but also uh, reducing the, the effective difference between, I've called it basis risk here, um, but the effective difference between what a, what a parametric would pay out and what an equivalent indemnity policy would pay out uh, if you look at a kind of a normal property basis uh, for the insurance. Um, and you know the the modeled loss basis is effectively um, we use uh, um, we use a catastrophe risk model. It's just locked in advance, um, and we uh, we we generate the uh, the pricing from using that catastrophe risk model uh, with with historical or stochastic um, storms, for example, for for cyclones. And then when the real storm happens, we run the same the track data from the NHC through that same model, and that what what comes out as the modeled loss is what we pay against. So that's quite equivalent. And actually, in, in the, um, from a contractual perspective, effectively what we're saying is that we're going we're gonna to agree to not go through the whole adjustment process. We're going to accept that the model is going to give us a reasonable estimate of the loss, uh, and we agree to pay on the basis of that reasonable estimate. Um, and so we can get quite sophisticated with, with those kind of models, um, but we also... You know, have found that explaining a modeled loss versus a, a, a parametric index, for example, can be quite challenging in, in the development context. Um, so uh, those are just the takeaways. I've talked about those already. Um, so a few practical examples of, um, of Earth observation in particular being used for parametric risk transfer in the development context. Um, and these are all projects that I've personally worked on. Uh, there, are, there are others, but, um, but I think I've covered all of the, uh, the, the main forms that the parametric insurance has been, been used in. Um, again, I'm not going to go into detail. Um, I did have slides for all of these different uh, schemes, but, um, but the slide deck was getting pretty heavy. So um, uh, we, we've used uh, trim for extreme rainfall um, as, as probably the uh, outside of earthquakes and hurricanes, which I haven't covered here because they're, they're fairly mainstream, I would say. Um, extreme rainfall was always the first thing that, uh, that I got asked about after we launched the CRIF. Every single Minister of Finance, every, everybody in the Caribbean said, well, what about rainfall? Um, hurricane models, as you guys probably know, do not capture rainfall very well. Um, and so uh, trim, trim was pretty much all there was there. Um, ground station density is nowhere near good enough um, and doesn't capture hurricane rainfall very well in a way. Um, so, um, so we use trim uh, in, uh, in the Caribbean, but, but this particular um, thing we did was a, a micro-insurance program in, uh, in Haiti for Foncose, which is the biggest MFI in Haiti, um, has uh, micro, women micro-entrepreneurs um, who are... The, the repayment rate for Foncosi is absolutely incredible. It's it's ninety nine point something percent. I mean, the, these these women are incredibly good clients of the microfinance institutions. Um, the the one time that they can't handle is when they get blown away by a hurricane, washed away by a flood, uh, shaken shaken down by an earthquake. So 
Um, this was a program I was working on before the, actually right before the earthquake, and we uh, we tested it with um, with the uh, with the earthquake as though the clients had insurance in place, even though they actually didn't. But we had the whole thing pretty much set up, so they were given payouts um, or had loan forgiveness as though the the, the insurance was in place. And, uh, and and building on that experience, we put put together a program, um, and. Uh, it was it was in place for a couple of years, um, and uh, um, I, I, you know, I'm not going to go into the detail, but I mean, it worked worked as advertised. the The, the main problem was that it was uh, because the risk is so high in Haiti, uh, it was just too expensive um, to add it onto the kind of the loan. The lenders' costs was was they just couldn't bear that cost. Um, we got some money to to pay for it. Uh, for for a few years, but then you know when that dried up, it was um, uh, it just uh, wasn't wasn't sustainable. And this goes to well, you know, who owns that risk in, in Haiti? You know, the development actors have put millions and millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars into Haiti year after year after year in the development context. Um, so they're paying for it. Um, to support this would be a heck of a lot better um, use of that a, a small chunk of that money, to be honest, and, and supporting. You know the economic engine of Haiti um, to 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 get past events that they can't control. I think is a pretty good model. But um, so that's that's one example. We did a NDVI for dairy farmers in the Dominican Republic. Um, they were worried very particularly about a loss of production for um, when when forage levels dropped, um, and so we we developed something for them. Um, and then we've done uh, WRSI-based uh, drought modeling in, in ARC um, and Elka here at the, at the back there. And there's a, a few great posters on the, on the flood stuff that we're doing. But ARC started out as uh, the first policies were, were drought using WRSI based on satellite rainfall. Um, so uh, those are you know, kind of rainfall related uh, for, um, for both high, ra high rainfall and low rainfall. Um, and uh, Using um, using both direct satellite rainfall estimates and uh, and greenness in the seas, a couple of a few that are kind of on the drawing board. Um, volcanoes. Um, we are in the middle of doing a project with the World Bank on uh, on on just exploring what's possible for volcanoes. Um, volcanoes are pretty complicated. There isn't any one signal that is going to tell you that it's about to erupt. Um, there are a multitude of signals, many of which can be uh, can be uh, obtained from space, um, and so give you the kind of coverage and uh, and um, kind of uniformity of data that that one would one would need. Um, these are interference rings from INSAR um, in, on a volcano in Alaska, um, and uh, so so ground deformation has definitely increased in its uh, ability to be routinely monitored. Um, but is is not there yet, um, and then uh, other other signals are being uh, starting to be processed routinely uh, on a global level. Um, so there's definitely potential there. I think uh, we're not we're not there yet, but I I hope that um, and I, David, we've we've spoken about this. You know, as an end, a potential end user, um, you know, parametric insurance I think can drive the kind of right right um, developments um, in uh, in some of these spaces. Wildfires is another obvious one. I don't think that there's been a wildfire parametric yet, but um, it's certainly something that I think we're starting to get to the point where it's uh, we have a an, enough of a history of um, of what it looks like, and then you know the the, the routine monitoring, which is very well developed now, of course. Um, so I um, there's 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 plenty of wildfire indemnity insurance, but I don't know that that it's been done on a parametric basis yet. And then another project I'm involved in is uh, is um, insuring coral reefs, um, and uh, there's been a lot of interest, a growing interest in the uh, ocean ocean risk space. Uh, it's not something that the traditional indemnity markets have really paid very much attention to. Um, nobody knows who owns the reef, um, who va who's values from it, but um, but cleaning up the reef very quickly after an, after a hurricane is incredibly important. Um, so. Um, uh, you know, just having a relatively modest policy which triggers on a hurricane index, which can um, which can generate some funding to to have a cleanup team, um, it can be really valuable. 
Um, and then I, as I was uh, looking for some stuff yesterday, I just came across this headline, which I think was after the Hawaii, um, actually it was after Florence, but, but in the context of uh, what happened at Kilauea, um, which I just thought was kind of amusing. Um, <laughs> that uh, volcanoes, even though they're incredibly challenging to, um, to, to model, um, is, is actually covered in, on Hawaii insurance policies, but, um, but flood is not. Um, uh, I'm going to skip that. That's in the Philippines. Um, I'm seeing your two minutes. Um, I, I'm going to just very quickly run, run through. Uh, actually, I'm going to skip the CRIF one, but I've said a little bit about that. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a potentially really good vehicle. It now covers both the Caribbean and Central America, um, and um, a really kind of good vehicle for channeling some of the, um, some of the risk quantification as well as just insurance. It's called an insurance facility, but it's really talking to a much broader range of, of issues. Um, ARC, uh, I could talk for hours and hours about ARC um, and, um, and would love to, but, um, but I think the really important thing about ARC is that it's really taken uh, this, uh, the, the, the kind of things that, that, um, that Daniel Clark and Stefan Durkan talk about in their book um, about you know, the preparedness, tying the preparedness to the financing having the early warning and the, 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 um, the insurance product being linked together so that there's, there's continuity between uh, the, the messages that the governments are getting about risk, about how it can be managed, about the importance of preparedness. Um, in, in ARC, the, uh, the, the money, the government has to come up with a detailed budget on how they're going to spend the payout. That, has, that, that detailed budget and action plan is audited. So we're, we're holding their feet absolutely to the fire in terms of how they're using that to make sure that they're using it to the, not only you know, to avoid corruption, et cetera, but also that it's going to the things that, where it has the most value because it's arriving very early. What are the investments that we can make right now to, to reduce the overall impacts? Um, and then the one flood example before my, I think is what's gonna be my final slide, um, is, um, Something, uh, the flood example, it's, not in, the, it's, it's in the US, um, but I just thought it might be uh, interesting. I'm not gonna go into the details, but it was a post-Harvey post Houston um, thing that came up. Um, it was from a levy improvement district, which those of you who know the US well, um, these are tax raising entities uh, who, have, who are mandated to look after the, uh, mainly the engineer aspects of, of levy systems. And, um, and so, and what this, this particular levy district, which is an extremely good levy district, it's, it's a very, very, very good reputation. Um, and, uh, uh, but they had flooding outside of the levy um, because they couldn't pump the water high enough, quickly enough um, during Harvey because, because two things. One, the rain rate was too high. And secondly, the water level was too high in the river. So those two things combined were what they wanted to be covered for. Uh, and so their engineers came up with a table of, okay, this is what we, this is where we're going to be in trouble. These are the conditions of, of uh, gauge height and, uh, and rainfall rate. And, um, and so we put together a parametric deal um, for them. Um, and uh, they, ultimately, they didn't buy it, unfortunately. Um, but um, it was very interesting to go through that process and, and have them think about, you know, what, what it would take and what, and also what they would spend that money on. And they were, they were you know, they, they said, yeah, absolutely. If we'd had, you know, a relatively modest amount of money, a couple of million dollars um, to give out to, uh, to the community. Um, so it wasn't insurance for the individual householders. It was, it was a, a, an ability to generate some funds that the levy district could, could spend in the immediate aftermath of this to, uh, to help the, the community. Um, and interestingly, this um, just, uh, yeah, I'm a very quantitative guy. When we took this, uh, this, this deal to the international markets, we went to a few markets, and, um, and the pricing differential that we got, even though it's, it's US, you know, it's US, the data's pretty decent. Uh, we got uh, rainfall, long history rainfall, flood, flood height, not, not so long, but um, the gauge, I think, was, was uh, 20, almost 20 years worth of, uh, of gauge data. Um, so... Um, pretty decent data, uh, and the the differential between the pricing we got was uh, three times differential between two two kind of mainstream reinsurance markets. I mean, it's a, it was a fairly small deal, but uh, even so, the the the, uh, the amount of <laughs> the amount of kind of wiggle room when when uh, uh, 
uh, a broker like Willis goes into the room and says, okay, this is the risk. It's all quantified for you. It's a parametric. Um, you know, what, what price can you, can you write that at? Um, there's still a huge, huge difference. So there's, um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of soft stuff around the edges, which, um, which is important to pay attention to as well. Um, and then just, just my final slide, just a few um, kind of out there questions, which I hope we can address um, the rest of the morning in the breakouts to some extent. Um, the one thing I, I always highlight to, uh, to the EO community in particular is that to do insurance, you need to have a probability of events happening. Um, and you basically build that up. Or you need to have some, some way of knowing of, of rooting that in history. You can, you can model it out, you can do um, simulations, but when you're talking to a client, if you can't po point to some historical events where which would or wouldn't have happened, would, would or wouldn't have triggered, then you won't, they, they won't believe what, what the model comes out of a model. So, um, so yes, having the best real-time data is great, but if you can't uh, have some kind of representation of what that data is now capturing for hi historical events, then it's very it's very difficult to use that that, that best data if you like um, in an insurance setting. So that's that's a flag. Um, I'm going to um, uh, yeah. So and I think the GPM and David, I've I've mentioned this to you. I think and other people have as well. The GPM is is fantastic. It's, it, you know we know that the real time stuff is great. We've done the comparisons with Trim and it's you know it's 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 hugely better. We can't use it yet for 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 rainfall parametric because we haven't got the history. Um, so um, we are literally, we are ready to go with three deals that I know of in the developing development space um, with uh, as, soon as, that, as soon as that history comes out. Within you know, a couple of weeks, we'll be able to switch it over. So um, just, just um, and I know that you, you know that, but it, it's really important in this setting to, um, to have that, that reliability of data. Um, so and, and and by the way, putting that together is absolutely incredible. And and the word that there's a poster there by EAR by by John and the co-authors on uh, on the flood modeling that um, the AER have done for uh, for Arc, uh, the footprint model modeling. Our biggest um, our biggest thing on our to-do list when we were looking for somebody to do this for us was we needed to have a history. We needed to be able to go to our African governments and say. We have this, these flood footprints going back to 2000 and, where is John? 2007? 98. So, you know, to have that, um, I think we, we said 2001 to start with, I think, because that's where RFE2 goes back to. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, the further the better. And, and that's... So I'll, I'll uh, Elka can probably uh, answer that question better. Um, it, it does contribute, but because we're using, um, you know, flood, flood footprint, um, not, not from a model basis, but from an actual what you're seeing, um, then uh, that would, that would uh, I think that would contribute to understanding how that flood footprint got there. But, um, but we need, we, we, we want to see that flood footprint um, and know what context that flood footprint happened in. Um, to be able to, uh, you know, demonstrate to go back to a big flood in 2001, for example, and say, look, this is what the tool that, that will be working in real time. This is what it came up with when that flood happened. Um, that's really, really important. Um, and uh, uh, so, so there's that. Um, yeah, the the second point I I want to highlight is that I really think that EO data has um, massive potential because of its global. It's global footprint, um, it's uniformity of coverage, it's ability to be you know, objectively processed, all, all of those things, standardized delivery. Um, and um, uh, you know, and NASA, I have to you know, say NASA, not just because they're sponsoring this, but um, uh, and, and NOAA as well. I mean, they're, they're really, the, the availability of those data sets, the, the incredible science that's behind them is absolutely fantastic um and um i just you know uh it, without without that it would have been very difficult to do what most of what we've done particularly outside of the earthquake and, and hurricane space so um so more of that and definitely you've got a you've got a 
an end user which I, I think is going to expand um, potentially very quickly, um, David, and, uh, and uh, potentially also beyond the developing world. I think that some of the stuff we've been doing in the developing world actually has huge application in the developed world as well. Um, and then the last thing was this, the forecast-based financing, which, which I think has, has a, lot of, uh, a lot of potential. And I think we'll see a lot more of those kind of um, deals happening and, and initiatives um, uh, in, in the next few years. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Simon. What a clear description of many use cases that we can really, I think, dig into as a community and think about how to move forward. We're a little over time, but we can take some questions for Simon before we move into breakouts. Oh, lots of hands. Okay. Andrew? So um, that's a that's a, a good question. I, I think um, depends on the sophistication of the uh, of the parametric instrument that we're trying to develop. Um, uh, in some contexts, context, yeah, reanalysis is really important. I, I, you know, a, an example would be the best track, the NOAA best track hurricane data set, which is a you know that's a reanalysis, um, and uh, I think without that we would be you know, we're, the, the the parametric insurance for, for hurricane risk would be a lot more, a lot less um, less used and a lot less useful. Um, and uh, so, and then in the you know, if you go to the model loss parametric, then we're using a lot of the same tools that that the, the cat modelers are using anyway. So um, uh, we we just I, I think concentrating on the on the hazard side of it rather than on the you know on the ultimate risk side so um we want to know what the ultimate losses are going to be or, or have a good estimate of them so that we know that they proxy what what we're trying to cover but really the concentration is on getting the hazard the hazard probabilities right because that's what the um so something i didn't really emphasize that the, the global risk takers love this stuff because uh, the probabilities and therefore the risk that they're taking is really down to the the, the hazard um, and so, and that's uh, that's an area they feel comfortable with. If they don't know about it, then they can find out about it. Dealing with stochastic hurricane track sets um, and and cat models is something that they do, uh, and they they're very comfortable with, but particularly at the hazard end of it. So, uh, and if you can if you can define the risk um, more tightly, then you're going to get better pricing from the market. So, uh, you know, if I um, African drought risk for a, for a country in the Sahel, if you'd taken that even to the most adventurous underwriter 10, 15 years ago, they would have said, no, we're good, thanks, right? Um, just because they wouldn't have known how to quantify it, not, um, not necessarily because it was a high risk, it's just they didn't know how high it was. Um, we've now, we're now transferring African drought risk into the international markets. We have 24 markets on the ARC reinsurance program. Um, it goes to 40, 45 reinsurers effectively so we're, we're sampling the entire market um, and we're getting the rate we're getting is absolutely incredible in terms of um, the, the margin the, the small margin over the over the, the expected loss cost so so it's an incredibly efficient way of transferring that that climate risk um, uh, but yeah it, it, it I, I think the reanalysis and, and the and the modeling is is very important um, at, at, especially on the you know in the uh, helps to build the understanding on the on the ultimate risk takers so you can start to do things that are really cost effectively more burning questions yeah Guy?
No, I think that's a really good point. And, and uh, I think most people you talk to in, on the insurance side would, would think that it was a given. So um, I think that's a, a really useful, useful point. And I'm happy to uh, act as the, as the point person to, uh, to, to make sure that we, we, we join our voices to you guys uh, in, in that. I, I should quickly mention that there's something called the Insurance Development Forum, which um, which my boss at Willis has, has helped to put together. And that's a, it's a basically an initiative between the the World Bank, the UN system, and the global insurance and reinsurance industry. And it includes all of the all of industry. It's not just a few a few key players. It's everybody. Um, and uh, they have actually just appointed a secretary general. Uh, gen uh, anyway, uh, uh, they haven't. They now have a secretariat after kind of. Um, getting into spin-up mode over the last 18 months, two years. Um, uh, and, uh, and so this is something that, you know, this is kind of thing that they would definitely be interested in, in taking up and, and being an advocate for. So, um, so we're starting to develop some of the, um, the institutional forms rather than it being coming from individual companies or individuals. It, you know, it can be from the industry as a whole. All right. Last question and then I'll give you your... Yeah, and and I just let me mention that the I mean what I think what you guys NASA did with the trim was just incredible. The, you know you were you're putting out data until the you know we were really worried about um, uh, about that because it would you know it would have if if you if you'd switched it off uh, we would have had to cancel all of the policies that we had based on trim. Um, and uh, but the fact is that you you know you, we we had the time to. Uh, to, to make the necessary arrangements. So I, uh, yeah, I, what, what that that was a great example of something that yeah, it's going to come to the end of its life. But you, yeah. Uh, so, but a good point, Alka. All right, last comment or question, and then we'll move to breakouts. Um, uh, I think six, six years is pretty difficult um, from a global perspective. Um, I think you could probably start to apply it in particular case, cases where you could build the history of, you know, in a particular area that was now part of that, that global monitoring um, and you could build a picture of what history would look like. Um, so I, I I certainly don't want to stifle innovation. Um, absolutely not. Um, I, I was just making the point that until we can deploy, uh, it, there's, there's a there's a barrier to deploying a new tool immediately, um, and that barrier is that what that tool, how that would have behaved, um, or what it's trying to capture. I had a conversation with somebody yesterday about well, what what about if you know new technology could um, you know, could say whether a, a pixel was flooded, a, you know, a t 10 meter pixel was flooded in the middle of a city now, um, would that be useful? And, and the fact is that you, you know, if you, if you put your mind to it, we could probably put together a, a history of what, when that pixel was, was flooded from various sources, it wouldn't be uniform, but if we could do that, then we can use that data because we can say, well, you know, we, now we can measure that down to that level. We we couldn't before, but we've you know we put together a history, um, and and then you know the point I just made about the you know the price different pricing in the markets, that's very much about the story that you tell around 
the data. Um, and the, the easiest story to tell is, well, here's 30 years of history from this bird, and you know that's what we're going to use in real time. And um, you know, so and that's a very easy story to tell. But I think we've gotten better at telling stories around, you know, putting together data sets which are a little bit more complicated and um, multiple multiple sources as well. And I, I personally feel pretty confident that um, that you know you can you can start to do that. But it, but um, uh, it's very much on a case by case basis. Um, and uh, some of the you know one of the one of the drawbacks to that is is that um, it does end up being kind of costly in inverted commas. Um, and you know when some of these deals are fairly small, that cost is difficult to bear within the you know. Um, so uh, as a, as a kind of research challenge, yes, we could definitely do it. But in a practical uh, mainstreaming of these kind of tools into um, in, into insurance, you have to be careful about those additional costs. Thank you so much, Simon. Okay, so we're running a little bit over, but may I suggest grabbing coffee and taking a quick, you know, five to 10 minute break on the way to your breakout session?